My name's Lee Jackson, and I'm an author and historian fascinated with the social history of Victorian London. In my recent book, Palaces of Pleasure, I've been exploring the history of mass entertainment, and in particular, the Victorian Pleasure Garden. In this talk, I'm going to discuss North Woolwich Gardens, a pleasure garden beside the River Thames. Pleasure gardens were parks with spaces for drinking, dining and dancing, and popular entertainment. They were commercial venues, open to the paying public during the summer months, when, weather permitting, visitors could enjoy themselves late into the night. Vauxhall Gardens in Lambeth, which first opened in the 1660s, was the original and most famous ground, so much so that Manchester, Birmingham and even New York had their own so-called Vauxhall. I think we now tend to associate pleasure gardens with the late 18th and early 19th century, when Vauxhall was its most famous and fashionable. There is, for example, a well-known scene in Thackeray's Vanity Fair where his characters visit Vauxhall Gardens at the height of their Regency splendour. But the Victorians also went on to create their own pleasure gardens, often aimed at a more mass market, working class clientele. One such ground was the Royal Pavilion Pleasure Gardens, the Royal Gardens, or more commonly known as North Woolwich Gardens, which is the subject of this talk. The origins of North Woolwich Gardens lie in the railway boom of the 1840s, when a new line was built from Stratford in East London to the Thames at North Woolwich. The purpose of this line, opening in 1846, branching off the Eastern Counties Railway, was twofold. Firstly, North Woolwich could be used as a coal depot. Coal, brought along the Thames by boat, could be transferred to freight trains and shipped quickly and cheaply back into the Eastern Counties. Secondly, the new railway line linked up with the Woolwich Steam Ferry and provided a quick route from Woolwich, south of the Thames, into London. But the projectors of the railway also bought up land in the area, which was little more than marshes, intending to build houses, wharves, warehouses. They also planned a hotel, known as the Pavilion, with extensive picturesque grounds to attract tourists. This was the beginning of North Woolwich Gardens. This might seem a curious remote spot to choose for a tourist destination, but steamboat trips along the river were very popular, including to Rocheville Gardens at Gravesend, a rival attraction a little further downstream. Organised visits to Woolwich Arsenal across the river were also a familiar part of the London tourist trail. Indeed, as it turned out, the Pavilion Hotel and its gardens were the main outcome of the railway company's initial investment in draining additional land in the 1840s. Vacant housing plots, for example, can still be seen on the 1860s Ordnance Survey map. Few houses were built and likewise it would be some years before the district became known for its industrial character. The first mention I can find of the Pavilion Hotel actually in operation is a court case from 1849. A housemaid at the hotel was accused of stealing a guest brooch while they took afternoon tea. The following year, press advertisements appear for the Royal Pavilion Tavern and Whitebait House. The dining room of the tavern overlooked the Thames and Whitebait was a popular delicacy at such riverside pubs. The original licensee, one James Hutt, was succeeded by Henry Churchill Lugbrobe in July 1851, a large advertisement for the gardens then appear, mentioning both the Great Exhibition and Woolwich Arsenal, promising that tourists will find every attention paid them, with dinners of every description provided on the shortest notice. It is only the following year, however, 1852, that we begin to see advertisements for a pleasure garden proper. Admission costs sixpence, the sort of price affordable to members of the working class in regular employment. By comparison, the slightly more aristocratic Cremel Gardens in Chelsea cost a shilling. These early adverts from 1852 highlight a brass band with the well-known conductor Mr. Gratan Cook, with dancing beginning at 7 o'clock with splendid illumination, i.e. a profusion of gas lights. Dances are organised by a dancing master or master of ceremonies called Mr. Moxie. Evenings finish with fireworks, a grand panoramic and pyrotechnic display of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. There was also, during the same year, the occasional chance to see a hot air balloon ascend over the grounds. The gardens, in fact, very much took their cue from rival grounds in London, both in terms of one-off events like balloon flights and more regular attractions. Admittedly, when North Woolwich Gardens opened, Vauxhall had already declined in prosperity, was on the verge of closure. But the likes of Cremon Gardens in Chelsea, the Eagle Tavern on the City Road, and Highbury Barn in Islington all provided something of a template. We can see this in contemporary newspaper adverts and a few surviving posters listing the ground's attractions, which are exactly the sort of thing one might also see at Cremorne or Highbury. Thus on one night in 1853, the gardens hosted a balloon ascent, 
with the brothers Hayes performing acrobatic tricks hanging from the balloon's carriage. There was also the surprising Bourne family, who were known for acts of equestrianism, tightrope dancing, gymnastics, palandric, balancing on a pole, and globe performance, balancing on a giant ball. There was also Miss Cottrell, the graceful equestrienne, a well-known circus performer, a dog act displaying a laughable exhibition of canine sagacity, and a monster marquee for dancing, allegedly capable of holding 3,000 people. There were also, once again, fireworks to conclude the evening. The Ordnance Survey map of the 1860s reveals the layout at North Woolwich in some detail. Perhaps most importantly, there is now not merely a grand marquee, but a capacious dancing platform. Dancing was perhaps the most popular Victorian entertainment at the Victorian Pleasure Garden, and managers often invested in elaborate platforms with sprung wooden boards and a large accompanying orchestra. The map also reveals a variety of spaces for indoor amusement whenever the weather turned bad, a theatre, ballroom and a dining saloon. There is also a maze, a rifle range and the garden's most distinctive feature, a long tree-lined promenade beside the Thames. We can also glean some further details from contemporary press reports and reviews. An account in the Stratford Times from 1859, for example, tells us that the dancing platform, exactly like its rival at Cremorne Gardens in Chelsea, was styled in the fashion of a Chinese pagoda, and that the gardens also boasted illuminated fountains, as well as a stage by the lake for the performance of drawing room entertainments and the display of pose plastique. The latter were elaborate three-dimensional recreations of famous paintings, typically of Greek myths, with actors posing statue-like, usually in flesh-coloured body stockings for the sake of modesty. In terms of performers, anyone and everyone, in fact, could appear at a pleasure garden. Of course, the availability of large open spaces outdoors meant that circus acts were particularly popular. Performers on the tightrope and trapeze, equestrian acts, and the likes of firewalkers, whose tricks were too dangerous or cumbersome to set up within a theatre. North Woolwich, for example, featured Herr Chevalier, the Austrian salamander, who, clad in an insulated costume, walked through an avenue of burning arches. But the gardens also attracted regular variety acts, famous comic singers and music hall stars. Sam Cowell, arguably music hall's first international superstar, appeared at the gardens in 1856. Cowell came from a theatrical family and had previously appeared at Evans's Supper Rooms in Covent Garden and most famously the Canterbury Hall in Lambeth, London's first grand purpose-built music hall. His repertoire included, for example, the capital new racy comic song, to quote a contemporary advertisement, are you good-natured, dear? In which a naive provincial, arriving in London, cannot fathom why he keeps being asked this question, a stock greeting used by metropolitan prostitutes. Cal's most successful song was The Rat Catcher's Daughter, a black comedy where the heroine finishes tumbling headfirst into the Thames and drowns. The hero, a street seller of sand, then cuts his own throat and his donkeys into the bargain. Cal was a star performer in his day, as one reviewer said, it being impossible to convey by words the inexpressible mirth which even his silence creates. He would go on to tour America before returning to the UK, but unfortunately, like so many musical stars, succumbed to alcoholism. He died bankrupt, aged 44, attempting to recover his health in rural Dorset while still consuming a bottle of brandy a day. Music hall acts, in fact, increasingly appeared at North Woolwich, and the grounds in turn would be managed by two famous music hall proprietors. Charles Morton, who had built the Canterbury Hall, took over the gardens in 1868 and built two new dancing platforms. But he struggled to make a profit, had bad luck with the weather, and his biography notes that he complained that Woolwich was utterly at the mercy of the elements. He was succeeded by William Holland, or Bill Holland, a larger-than-life music hall manager who had famously discovered and promoted George Laybourne, otherwise known as Champagne Charlie, and had him drive around London in an elaborate carriage dressed in character. Holland ran much publicised baby shows within the gardens in 1869 and 1870. Infants were presented to the public in the arms of their mothers with the lure of a cash prize. Baby shows were an American novelty, popularised in part by Barnum in the 1850s. They had not really taken off in England, but Holland made a determined attempt. One newspaper mused that most people prefer going to the gardens on a day when babies were rigidly excluded, but scores of them in full cry might afford a pleasurable excitement to mothers. Prizes were giving out for best triplets, twins, best boy and girl, rated on the grounds of health and beauty, for the neatest, prettiest cradle or bassinet, and the finest and heaviest child under six months and 12 months respectively. 
Mothers were required to bring birth certificates and proof of smallpox vaccination. And the jury consisted of six ladies and six nurses. Holland provided free rail travel for mothers and babies from Bishopsgate and Fenchurch Street. And the first show reportedly received 4,000 applicants, with 400 placed before the public. Contestants came from as far as Manchester and Scotland to participate. Mothers were arrayed on numbered chairs laid out in long rows, obliged to sit while the public strolled past, occasionally pausing to ask questions or compliment their child. The event was somewhat contentious, with some critics comparing it to a cattle market, one speaking of monstrous violations of the proprieties. Some wondered if children should be displayed in public shows, as one writer put it, like pigs or pelagoniums. Holland, however, was not dissuaded. Indeed, in 1870, he produced another novel display, a barmaid show, which became so popular that it became an annual event. Young women were to stand behind separate bars in an exhibition hall and serve drinks to visitors over a period of six days. The women were originally judged by a jury, but in later years, the public handed their preferred barmaid a ticket to register their vote. The barmaids were to dress plainly, but with a happy blending of colors, to ingratiate themselves in the most affable manner, but without undue forwardness or frivolity. This must have been something of a fine balancing act. This peculiar beauty contest reportedly drew numerous young men to the gardens, although not all were impressed. One letter writer complained of the women on display. Among the 30, only two had any pretensions to personal attraction. In 1871, Holland staged a less contentious cat show, a direct competitor to a rival event at the Crystal Palace in Sydenham, and the following year, a rather more novel monkey show with a special prize for performing monkeys. This may all seem rather random, but the beauty of a pleasure garden was that anything and everything could be thrown before the public. If it proves successful, it will be revived the following year. If not, it will be dropped. It is striking, for example, that we possess a poster from 1878 advertising a grand fancy dress ball, which might conjure up images of elaborate masquerades. The Era, a theatrical paper, described it as a more humdrum affair, noting that the proportion of visitors in costume to those in ordinary attire was not very great. It never is at entertainments of this kind. The average Englishman and woman dread to array themselves in garments of a different pattern from the everyday wear, fearing they may look ridiculous. The public at North Woolwich were average Englishmen and Englishwomen, largely drawn from the working class East End. What the diarist Arthur Mumby, who visited the gardens in 1869, described as respectable looking artisan folk, i.e. the better off skilled members of the working class and their families. Mumby also describes in detail one of the main attractions on the day, a pair of female cyclists dressed as men in jockey caps and satin jackets and short breeches ending above the knee and long stockings and mid-leg boots, who ride astride their bicycles rather than side saddle, circus riders from the Paris Hippodrome. Another account from the 1870s again stresses the propriety of the gardens. The dancing, the reporter notes, is enthusiastic but proper and modest, with no performances of the can-can, which had formed part of the spectacle at rival Highbury Barn. The piece also mentions the fairground aspects of the gardens, including swings and merry-go-rounds, which became more typical of London pleasure gardens during the 1860s and 1870s. We also read elsewhere of fortune tellers, a test your strength machine, weighing machines and rifle galleries. Again, the journalist in question portrays North Woolwich as relatively respectable. Thus he notes, describing the whirl of the merry-go-round, the lads are gallant, hilarious and festive, the lasses timid, coy, confiding, apprehensive displaying ankles and bewitching. Vauxhall Gardens in its heyday was notoriously a place to meet prostitutes, and Cremon Gardens was famously the resort of upmarket courtesans, who attended the more aristocratic visitors who parted in Chelsea late into the night. North Woolwich, on the other hand, had a reputation for decency. Why then did these gardens close? Bill Holland's second bankruptcy in 1881 robbed the gardens of its most famous and charismatic manager, although he continued in the entertainment business and would go on to manage the Blackpool Winter Gardens. One important factor is that, like many pleasure gardens, North Woolwich was originally situated in a rustic, remote location, but one that came to be surrounded by the expanding city. For some gardens that were situated in inner London, such as Cremorne or Highbury Barn, the expansion of the metropolis meant growing numbers of middle-class suburban residents complaining about their presence. Local householders generally resented living next door to a noisy place of popular entertainment. By the mid-1880s, on the other hand, 
North Woolwich still boasted a few domestic properties. It was now home to manufacturers of telegraph equipment, India rubber, a sugar refinery, gas works, chemical plants and sewage works. The smell could not have been entirely pleasant, and there were also contemporary complaints about sewage in the river itself. There was a sense too that by the 1880s, pleasure gardens were finally considered rather passé, a quaint place of old-fashioned entertainment. Pleasure gardens, more practically, were also more difficult to run and maintain than, say, a grand music hall, and crucially, constantly at the mercy of the unpredictable British summer. And while some still appreciated journeys along the Thames, the railways had made the seaside proper and seaside resorts, such as Southend and Margate, ever more accessible. In the mid-1880s, therefore, the owners of the land on which the gardens stood made clear they were happy to sell for £25,000, something like £1.5 million in modern money. A campaign was launched, dubbed the North Woolwich Garden Acquisition Fund, with the Duke of Westminster as chairman, to acquire the ground as a public park, which was ultimately then handed over to the new London County Council in 1890. Nothing now hints that this humble park beside the Thames was once one of the capital's busiest places of amusement, where thousands enjoyed all the fun of the fair, danced under the stars, watched an elaborate display of the fireworks, and then hurried to catch the last train home. Thank you.